This is Story Talk, a series of online conversations featuring storytellers and artists from different parts of the world, especially curated for the fifth anniversary of StoryFest Singapore. Today, I'm going to be talking with Zante Gresham Knight all the way in the UK. Zante is an author and performance storyteller. We're going to be chatting about how to adapt text for performance storytelling. Hi, Zante. Nice to have you with us at Story Talk. Hi, Kamini. Lovely to be here. Thank you for asking me. So, Zante, you're both a storyteller, a performance storyteller, as well as a writer, published author. So, could you share with us a little bit about these two different strands of your practice, your storytelling work and your work as a writer? Well, it's amazing because I always wanted to write when I was younger, but I could never think of anything beyond the first line, which always said once when I was younger. And then I could never think of anything else to write. Obviously, you'd get essays at schools and things. And then I discovered storytelling. And it was I think I've been telling stories for about 25 years, 24 years before I, I got to writing. So it was storytelling that enabled me to write, I think. And you work a lot with very big and long stories, epics and legends, and you not only write them and have them published in books, but you also adapt them for the stage for actual performance storytelling. And we in Singapore had the privilege and honor of hearing you share with us Shana Me, you know, one of your classic works. Could you talk to us a little bit more about this process and, you know, this work that you do? Well, I think really it starts with with thank yous to people. I, I went to Oxford University and I was very lucky to do that because I came from a comprehensive school, which I don't know if the system in the UK. Um, it wasn't a particularly good secondary school. Let me just say that it was it was really not. But somehow I got uh, entered into the entrance exam. And when I got to the interview, they told me that my sentence construction and spelling was that of a 12 year old. <laughs> but I think they were having a drive on getting uh, comprehensive school kids in and they said they, they thought I had flair. And so it was my um, three years studying English literature that made me not so frightened of big texts and, and to fall in love with big texts. And I think I started with folk tales and things with storytelling, but when the opportunity came along and the British Museum asked, asked me to do Shaname or a section of Shaname, I, I, I leapt at the chance to combine this sort of more simple art form of storytelling with a, a literary art form. So coming back to, you know, your work with lots of epics and long stories, you know, what draws you to them? What inspires you to work with them and what do you like about them? Well, I have adapted Shakespeare as well for children, which was wonderful. And having, I was an actress, I, I haven't mentioned that I had three years of, at a great drama school, also very fortunate to have that. And so and then I went into um, a, a theatre company where we were like a rep style and we did, you know, play after play after play after play. And there were only, I think, five of us or seven of us, I can't remember now. And we just played all the characters. So I memorised loads of Shakespeare. And of course, he used traditional stories and he used metaphors that all the poets were using at the time and when I discovered that the other great epic writers were doing the same I realized that there's this big link between the oral tradition and the written tradition certainly when we're going back to epic literature and I love this idea of storytelling as a kind of cathedral building you know the cathedral builders didn't put their name to any of their, their constructions, they, they just gave, gave it out there. And I think although we've got the name of Shakespeare, we've got the name of Fadowsi who wrote Shana May, Book of Kings, they would be the first to say, look, we are magpies. We've gathered the wisdom of the centuries. And, and there's one phrase that I really love by the poet Nizami. And when I came to tackle Nizami, who is also a, a great Iranian Persian writer, I was stunned by the first page of The Seven Princesses. It was so poetic, so dense with images that you just want to drink down. He says, as water weaves pearls in shells, so the old poets wove words and strung them on a thread of story. Never say they're dead, only speak their bright words, say their bright lines, and their heads will pop out of the stream of time like little fish. <laughs> it's just... It's gobsmacking. And, you know, they didn't, they do things like 
in Shana May, he'll say something like, she was ice before the fire of her own desire, ice before the fire of her own desire. You know, maybe say it twice because, hey, this is a great image. How else do you describe burning passion? Um, yeah, but probably, you know, thousands and thousands of poets have used it before then and since because, you know, they want a shorthand straight to the heart. So what's your process, right? Working with language and literature like this and big stories. And some of these stories are very familiar to the audience, different variations and versions. What's your process like as a performance storyteller when you take one of these stories and you think about presenting it? to a live audience, you know, on stage? Well, it totally varies. So if you take something like Shana May, I was asked to tell the story of the Simorg for the British Museum. And I had my version of it, very simplified. And then it went in front of audiences, countless audiences, because after working at the museum, I would take it into schools and it found its rhythm, it's found its music. And I think, I know I wrote a, a, a you know a little excerpt of Simorg for your for your collection, which I'm, I'm thrilled to get it in print because I feel that again that's not my work. Obviously, it was Fedowsi's work, but then it was the work of you know th literally thousands of children and families looking in their eyes and thinking they like that bit or listening to a rhythm that the children pick up. And I think I'm most proud of those kind of stories. So that's a very different way of working to say the way I worked with Sora and Rusta. And that was, uh, I remember deciding I, I'd had an emotional, uh, emotional time in my life and it meant that I'd, I'd lost a lot of things and I had a month to work on Saurabh and Rustam and they were paying me a thousand pounds, I'll never forget that, which seemed like a massive amount and they were going to pay me a thousand pounds to get this story together that was including performances. And I thought, I, I want to do something really big and brilliant for them. So I went through the text of Saurabh and Rustam. I looked at lots of different texts. I can't, I can't uh, speak Farsi, sadly. Um, but you, you can get the drift of the way the poetry goes if you look at a few translations. And back then it wasn't in print. Um, there, wasn't, there wasn't a version of Shahnameh. And I spent ages finding the, the most beautiful couplets and the shortest way of telling the story. It had to be, in, I remember I had to do it in 30 minutes. And then I memorized it. I worked like the old poets. I memorized it and it took ages. I think the version you saw was probably quite a bit better than the first version, but the first version was okay because um, it, I had a strong rhythm. I decided to put it in iambic pentameter because that's, that's internalized through working with so many Shakespeare characters. I know that rhythm and it's also the heartbeat. Um, it was a different rhythm, obviously, in, in Farsi. So I put it all in iambic pentameter. And once I'd done that, it was much easier to memorize. And then I remember Hampstead Heath, I walked on Hampstead Heath for days and days. It was not because I wanted to, I suppose I did want to create something brilliant, but I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to fill up the gap that I had in my life with poetry and it worked. I just was obsessed. And, and then, and when, then when I used to tell the story, it was like jumping on a train because the rhythm would go ding, 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 ding. and it was ages before I would dare do a little aside or chat to the audience. You know, I would have a drum beat going behind me, sometimes live, sometimes recorded, and I was off. And then as I got to know it a lot better, I, the poetry would come out as if I'd just made it up and I could stop and I knew I wasn't going to forget. I could have a chat with the audience. I could incorporate some more play. Um, but yes, it was a bit of a freak. And, and that's how I worked on countless stories now, mainly, mainly from Shana May, but also working with Shakespeare, where I will use the original poetry. I don't know whether it's better, but I, I love doing it. It's, I call it my Sudoku. You know, it's like I put words into, into rhyme and I learn them and I go for a walk and then I wake up in the night and I've got these flowers unfurling. What are some of the challenges, Dante, you know, in taking these very well-known and long texts and, you know, presenting them as storytelling performances? What's the challenges that you face? Yeah, so I think the main challenge is it takes me hours and days to work on texts I've fallen in love with. And 
and they will always talk about killing your own babies in writing. And then I'll, I'll tell somebody and I see their eyes glaze over and I think, oh, too much poetry, too much poetry. And unless the poetry is really a kind of like slippery clay, um, there's a word for when you have a slippery clay, I can't remember what it is, but you, you, it has to be like that, or melted butter. It has to kind of be really malleable in your hands. In, order, in fact, the biggest compliment I can get is if somebody says, was that in verse at the end of it? It's got to sound like natural speech. And that takes absolutely ages. And it's risky because storytelling you know, is eye to eye, mind to mind, heart to heart. And I love a fresh story. I, I love just making it up. I love inspirational stories, but there's something I feel, if those great poets took the time to gather the Im images in the first place, write them down. And if I'm going to be trusted, and there's a big issue with cultural appropriation, a big issue there. If I'm going to be trusted with the work of these great, great writers like Nizami and Fadawsi, then, you know, I've got to squeeze every bit of training and talent and commitment out of me to make them work. And, and then, then they've got to be piloted in front of an audience. So it's, I call it more of a, I call the craft of storytelling like making shoes. It's hammer, 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 work, work, work. And um, hopefully you get something you can walk, walk in and take around. So what would you say, you know, with all these years of experience and, you know, uh, and having both written and told these stories to someone who wants to start and embark on this process? So they have a story in mind, a very big story, a well-known epic, and now they, they want to adapt that text to stage. What kind of advice would you give them? Some tips? I'm laughing because as soon as you say that, I think of things to say that I would never do myself. Um, so my first thing to say is I would say, you know, try, try telling that story on its own without any of the poetry and get the rhythm of it and uh, see how it goes, you know, reduce it down to 10 key points. But in reality, I, I don't do any of those things. I, it's hit and miss. I don't quite know. Follow your instincts is all I can say. Follow your instincts and don't. Um, it's absolutely unnecessary, really, to put it all into poetry. It's, it's absolutely unnecessary, you know. If you're inspired by something and you drink it in and internalize it, it'll come out in the right way. And I hate seeing the storytellers who can, you know, chatting along like this and then they suddenly go, thine eyes I love or something, you know, something. It, it, I don't want to see that. I don't want to see that. It's not necessary. As I say, it's Sudoku for me. Um, if you're a musician, someone like Robin Williamson is very good to look at. I saw Robin Williamson telling story, just stories at a sea cat festival. And I thought, wow, that guy's great. And he's so funny and he, he's so brilliant. And his repartee in between is, 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 is so inspired. I went again, he was doing another show. It was exactly the same, his improvisation. He'd memorized his improvisation. So I think it's about making whatever version you want to tell malleable he'd obviously practiced it he practiced it with music because he was strumming his harp as he was working so that's why they say go and walk your story it's it's something about telling it over and over and over again if it's to a person or the bookshelf or a lamppost just keep telling it until it it fits you you know like a hand fits a glove it just has to fit you so there, there are no rules. How does a story fit? You know, you know the answer. You know what to do. You listen to storytellers and think, okay, how am I going to do that? Abby Patrick's, I once saw Abby Patrick's tell a story. And it was about, it was the famous story about um, how, I, I can't remember, I've, I've changed it to, to a girl looking for her luck. But I think the way he told it was a boy looking for God. And he had a drum and he told it. And it was like transmission. I just came away thinking, oh, I, I know how to do it. I, I, what, I know how to do it. And then I forgot, I forgot it completely. And about three years later, I was asked to do, I don't know what story. And it, in the middle of the night, I woke up and thought, it's a girl, she's gonna get her luck. And I'd forgotten how he told it completely, but I remembered the essence of his telling. I remembered his joy, his playfulness, his boyishness. And I remember it, it was, that's, and I thought that is transmission. That's transmission, because when he works, he's, he, I think he, he makes stories malleable. So 
I, I would hope that if, if I get it right, it works like that for other storytellers. Watch other storytellers, see what hits you and then do it your own way. The other thing I would say that I, as a practice that I, I live by is if I've got a story, I lie on my back, I shut my eyes and I let the images take me. Often I have a little sleep, you know, and then I'll be drifting off and something will come and it, then it, all the dross goes away and the bit that wants to find you does. I, I understand that perfectly. You know, you're lying down and you just visualize the whole thing and you kind of hear the words, right? You hear the words and how they want to be told. It's a process. Zante, what are you working on currently? I know you're doing this entire series called The Goddess Lounge. Could you share a little bit more with us about that? Yes, I feel very passionate about The Goddess Lounge. I was very lucky with um, writing that the journey started with Barefoot. I was telling Shana May. I met someone telling a, uh, running a workshop. And from that, I did The Princess and the Pea, which is here. And I worked on that in the same way. Um, and then oh, I've got to tell you about this. I know you've not asked me this question, but um, I did Thumbelina, which was also I worked on in the same way, same way as if I'm telling a story over and over and over and over again. And when it's in my head, I, I write it down. This one is hilarious because I'm really proud of this story. Um, it's Wild Swans and she, she weaves um, coats for her brothers out of nettles. And I wasn't getting it. So I went and wove with nettles and it's I'm not going to swear then, it's very painful. It's like a thrilling in your in the tips of your fingers. Um, so yeah, that's but that that worked, that worked. And also it's got a good stepmother. I'm a stepmother and I'm sick of bad stepmother stories. This I wrote with my, my husband, uh, Sussex Folktales, really pleased with that because I'm rooted in my landscape now. But this book is my latest and it's um, published by Thames and Hudson. It's Goddesses and Heroines. And I feel so lucky to have 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 um, been asked to write it, but the end, and I'm answering your question here, is really what I'd like to say about storytelling and writing. There's a section on goddess symbols, and this is saying how they repeat from generation to generation, from continent to continent, goddess to goddess, birth, life, death. And then each story has a symbol. So here we are, let's see what we've opened it up, because I'm a great believer in synchronicity and chance. And we come to Mulan, China and Baba Yaga, Russia. So here we have uh, her skull and her spindle and her mortar and pestle. So the skull is obviously, you know, got, everybody knows the Vasilisa story with fire behind the eyes. We've got the spindle weaving life again from death and the mortar and pestle, the organs of generation together and the getting rid of the dross, the chaff to, to create seeds that will actually grow. And on that note, I wanted to create from this, I wanted this to be the seed that would grow into something much, much bigger. Because for me, the goddess is the environment. And we know the environment's in a terrible state. You know, what was I reading this morning? Something like, since the beginning of time, we've lost 83% of plants and 83% of mammals, uh, mammals, I'm getting excited, manimals, that's a great um, <laughs> play on words, isn't it? Manimals. Yeah, we, we, man, we've done bad things to animals. We've made them animals. Um, something like 83% of mammals and half of plant life has been wiped out. And 60% of that happened since 1970. So I, I, I feel very humble. Last month I had a Tanya Bat from Wahiki Island who has an eco village and really walks her talks. She lives the stories, she grows her own food. Katrina Faber, who's coming next month, um, the climate saving goddess does something similar in, in Denmark. There are these inspirational women. We had Anna Medeka a couple of months ago talking about the ancestors. And it feels like these little ideas that I've got are just mushrooming, like the mycelium network with all these fabulous women. So I've been very fortunate in my life, in my storytelling to, to I always wanted to write a book, but books maybe are not where it's at now. Maybe we're reversing, going back to hieroglyphics and cuneiform, and we're going back to pictures and, and symbols. We're going back to signs, to symbols, because we've got to do something quick. So we've got to look at these goddess symbols. What are they telling us? What's this wisdom? And then we've got to get out there. There's probably no time to memorize epic poems anymore. We need to be talking about the climate, you know, encouraging people to be planting seeds, recycling, making scientific and environmental projects that will change the world. 
Um, so this is a tiny stab at that and trying to pull together. It's, it's, it's one UK local storyteller, one international storyteller and one UK international storyteller every month for six months, funded by the Arts Council. And they, they do a presentation and then we chat. And then the audience come on and chat too. So yes, I, I yes, I hope it's a, you know, I hope it's the butterfly's wing effect for what needs to happen. That's an awesome project and such a, you know, I guess it's also serendipity because to do this online so that lots of people around the world can actually appreciate and sort of virtually attend, you know, I think that's a blessing in disguise and really, a, you know, a wonderful project that you're working on, something unusual for all of us who love stories and also want to see a different layer and a different perspective and these guests that you invite and, you know, what they share. So thanks, Zante, for sharing with us the project Goddess Lounge. Um, and thank you for joining me on Story Talk Singapore. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kamini. Thank you very much. We've been talking to Zante Gresham Knight, storyteller and author. If you'd like to find out more about the different applications of storytelling, please do watch the rest of our videos on this series, Story Talk. You can find all the videos on Storyfest Singapore's YouTube channel.